Hi, this is Cez Zablin. And I'm Max Newbold. We are Second Life Correspondents for Smart History. And here we are once again in the recreation of the Sistine Chapel. On, on Vassar's campus. And we're going to talk this time not about the ceiling, but about the fresco that Michelangelo painted on the wall behind the altar uh, in the Sistine Chapel about 25 years later. After, and after the ceiling. After the ceiling. The Last Judgment. The Last Judgment, and from 1534 to 1541. So this one took about seven years. Now, this was actually a commission that came from not Julius II. No, he was dead. Right, but from two popes, actually. It was Clement VII who had sort of arranged um, for the back wall to be painted, the wall, which is really critical because it's directly in back of and above the altar, the right. high altar, where the, the, pope, the Pope himself stands That's right. and, and, and addresses the, the cardinals. I mean, there is no more sacred a space, really. Yes. Uh, it was Paul III who did the final commission? Who comes right? right after Clement VII. That's okay. right. This is a very, very old subject. It's, it's the one of the judgment, oldest yeah. subjects. It's the last judgment. It's when uh, Christ returns to the earth, the time of the second coming, and, and judges all of mankind and separates um, on his left those who have sinned who will go to hell and those on his right, the blessed who will go to heaven. So we need to think about this in terms of Christ's left and Christ's right as he separates the blessed from the damned. So this subject is probably the single most terrifying subject yeah. that one could expect to see in the Catholic tradition. And in fact, interestingly, it is often a subject that is painted or carved directly over the exit of a church so that when you leave, sometimes an entrance, sometimes but, an entrance. but very often over an exit so that when you leave the church, <laughs> it's the last thing right. you see right. before you go back into the world. Because, you know, of course, everybody is full of good intentions in church, but walking back into <laughs> the real world, um, one needs a good dose of... Uh, yes of fear, yes. um, and this would really provide Sin that. and you will burn in hell. That is basically the message of the last judgment. But you said a moment ago that it's important to understand this painting within the context of the historical, the political context of the day. Um, this is being painted again in 1534, 1541, and Europe is in, tr in turmoil mm -hmm. at this moment. Yes. And the Catholic Church itself is threatened to its core. It is. About 20 years before this was painted, Luther nailed his 95 theses, theses. to a door of a, a church. And in, in northern Germany. In northern Germany, quite far away. But but Luther was, was, was a Catholic priest. Yes. But he was forcing a kind of reform. Within the church, yes. And, and pointing to very specific practices within the Catholic Church that he believed were were corrupt. Interestingly, and ironically perhaps, practices that helped finance Julius II and Michelangelo's earlier right. commissions. Right, and the rebuilding of the Church that's of St. Right. Peter's. That's right. right, but that's another story. Yes. <laughs> so the church is in turmoil. Really, the period that we've been describing as the High Renaissance, this embrace of the human body, of, of the classical and of classical antiquity, that period is really over. The church is under attack. And it's important to see this fresco in, in the context of an embattled church. This is a painting that is full of a kind of anger and fear. And I think you're right. I think this notion of a kind of context that is absolutely threatening will make sense because gone is so much of the optimism and so much of the beauty, the ideal that, beauty. that Michelangelo renders on the ceiling. Yes. And instead you have a kind of absolute um, aggression. Look at Christ himself yes. in the center. Yes. Here we have Christ who is not paying attention to the blessed. His attention is focused on the damned. To his left, yes. That's right. And he, his hand is raised. You can actually see the stick. You can see the holes mm -hmm. um, where which he received on the cross. But he's about to smite the damned into hell. And it looks as though with his left hand he's pointing to the own, his own wounds that he received on the cross. Uh. As though he's saying, I suffered. Now those who have sinned will, will suffer, suffer as well. Right. It's almost Mary who's under his arm, who is actually attending in this painting to the blessed. But cowering beneath yes. him as though she no, can no longer help anyone. And she no can longer no longer protect. intercede ah, for mankind. That's really important. Yeah. Now Michelangelo is still Michelangelo, and he's still rendering Christ with a kind of massiveness that is an expression of his divinity. Yes. Almost, almost over the top here, almost mannerist actually. It's true. Um, and it's almost almost like Marvel Comics in a sense. I mean, look, it's muscle upon muscle in yes, that torso. Yes, strides forward. Now on either side of Christ are saints and other, you know, 
uh, important Old Testament figures. And this is traditional. <clears throat> and in fact, when we say when we say left and right, we it, mean lower left. That's and right. Lower right. It really doesn't. Um, this is heaven uh, right. when we're at this level. Right. And so the left right don't really right. accord. And so some of the figures that we see there, besides Mary, Christ. Uh, crouching under Christ's arm, we see um, St. Lawrence, for example, holding the the grill that he was We see St. Peter, on. With, see who's Peter looking with furious. Keys. He's got this key. And this is just slightly to the bottom right of Christ, to his left, we see a large figure of St. Bartholomew, one of the most grotesque images rendered in this painting. Yes, yeah, St. Bartholomew, uh, as many early saints were, was, was martyred. martyred in a really hideous way. And, and Bartholomew was flayed. He was skinned alive. And he's actually holding his own skin. In his left hand. As he holds the knife in his right, right. and looks up to Christ. Right. So he holds, as most saints do generally, the instruments of his martyrdom. But it's so graphically rendered yes. to hold his own skin, which just hangs down, is yep. extraordinary. And of course, there is a theory in the skin of St. Bartholomew. That the face that is rendered in the skin is actually a self-portrait of the artist. I think it's not, I guess it's a theory, but it's, it's. I think it's something we're pretty sure about because that really looks like Michelangelo. I mean, we know what Michelangelo looked like. We knew, know that Michelangelo had a kind of deformed bridge of his nose. That curly it really, brown hair. It really looks exactly like Michelangelo there. Um, and it's an extra extraordinary idea to begin to contemplate what Michelangelo would have meant yes. to render himself um, in this lifeless skin. And in in the place where he's put himself. Uh, and we sh let's, So let's come back to that. Okay. So let's talk for a minute about the figures in The Last Judgment, because we've talked about how that ideal beauty is gone. And here Michelangelo is really, it seems to me, moving away from that idea of beauty as a connection to the divine and as a way to get to the divine is, in, as, is instead portraying figures who are sometimes quite ugly. Ugly and also their limbs are no longer graceful, no. but akimbo. It seems this, this painting is full of activity, but it seems as if so often there's a kind of almost violence or almost a kind of... Um, chaos mm -hmm. in the way in which the figures uh, link together and the movements of the limbs between them. And their, you know, their their bodies are sometimes, you know, a little bit almost deformed. Their heads are too small. They don't have those lovely harmonious proportions like the figures on the ceiling. And it's almost as though it, it's always seemed to me that Michelangelo is saying, this is not a celebration of human beings anymore. This is a work of or art. Or of human beings' relationship to, to, God. to God. That's right. right. This, this is, is this is a, a painting where the, the message is primary. And he's going to do what he has to do to the figures, to the composition, to, to make sure that that message, which is sin and you will burn in hell, leave the church, betray the church, and you will, you will is a burn in hell for activity. eternity. So this is an extraordinarily modern idea. It will take hundreds of more years for artists to be comfortable with the idea of deforming the body in order to express a, 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 more, a, message. a more total message. Yes. This is a very modern idea. Yes, in that and sense. I, I think it's, it's perfectly seen in the figure of St. Catherine, who is holding a wheel, who bends forward. Her head is too small. Her arms are kind of grotesque. The position of her body is so awkward. There's just nothing beautiful and graceful about her. And, and we can say that about so many of the figures here. It's and one other thing that I like to talk about with the figures of the, of the saints who surround Christ, you know, Michelangelo, when he was painted these, painting these figures, he said, wanted to, to show these saints to sow the seeds of faith. Uh, and I think that showing these figures who died these really terribly painful deaths, St. Lawrence, St. Um, Sebastian who died by being pierced with arrows, St. Catherine who died on a wheel, these men and, and women who gave their lives and suffered so simply for their faith in Christ. That this idea that one can, one can believe, one can, you know, through anything, through, through all of these tests, one's faith in Christ can, 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 persevere. can persevere. One right? wonders then. Even in the face of death and suffering. And one wonders if that was a question that Michelangelo himself, in his older age, is beginning to ask of himself. Yes. Um, and, and I of think course, it's a question for this moment in it, time. It is, um, given the war, the suffering, the violence that is surrounding the church right. at this time. Right. Let's take a look at some of the figures that are a little bit lower down and okay. that really speak to the narrative of the Last Judgment itself. In some ways, um, we have to begin really with a group of figures immediately below 
Christ. The angels? Um, the angels blowing their golden trumpets as loudly as possible, almost looking like, uh, like you know, with their cheeks bulging out. To awaken the dead to, from their graves. That's right. And if we look a little bit to the lower left of those trumpeting angels, we can actually see Michelangelo. Christ's right. Christ, right? We can see the, in those green hills. Mm -hmm. We can actually see the dead being resurrected. These spirits, these uh, skeletons that are musty and rising from the dead. It's mm -hmm. it's a fabulous, almost literal mm -hmm. rendering. And then as they move up, angels reach down. These wingless, uh, seemingly male angels reach um, and grab them as they as they float well, up. Look at the group that are being pulled up, up by the rosary. Heaven. Right, that's as right. though but Michelangelo is saying by prayer. By one prayer. by the strength of prayer, but one can get to heaven. It's Michelangelo, so it's tangible and physical, yes. and it seems as if that angel has to be enormously <laughs> physically powerful to actually defy gravity and, and pull, pull them up. There's their strain and effort here. Yep. And then on the other side, Christ's left or our right, we have the figures who are damned to hell. Uh, and instead of the angels pulling them up, we now have the angels with their fists punching beating, them down. beating them down. And these figures here are trying to claw their way up, who angels force back down. Even as the devils below begin to claw at them and to pull them down I know, into it's hell. fabulous, isn't So it? being pushed and pulled, but probably the most memorable figure among this group is that damned man. The one who's just realized which way he's going. The, the sense of human torment, the pathos in that face is extraordinary. Yeah. There is there not only sadness and fear, but recognition of his own failings. And and to me, this the a sort of symbol of, of the human condition you know, that no matter how good we try to be, no how, matter how good our intentions, no matter how much we can see what is right, we often do what is wrong. But at this moment of reckoning, on this day of Christ's second coming, we are judged and, and the decision is rendered. And his expression so beautifully crystallizes that moment of recognition of ever of all of that truth. Yeah. It, once you get down to hell, yeah. Um, of course, the, you don't go directly to hell. You have to be ferried there. And Michelangelo. And a kind of classical mythology. That's right. That's right. And uh, uh, which is reiterated in a sense, m made permanent by Dante's Inferno. We have Sharon, the ferryman, who is beating the souls off of his boat to the shores of hell because, of course, they're incredibly reluctant, reluctant to, to go. go. But mm -hmm. they're also assisted by devils whose pitchforks are harvesting those yes. souls and bringing them down. And pulling them in. But perhaps my favorite... The far right bottom. That's right. My favorite element <clears> in the <throat> painting is the story just down at the bottom where we see Minos, who has a great serpent wrapped around his waist. Vasari tells a great story about this little vignette. According to Vasari, Michelangelo wanted very much for the Pope not to bring visitors in as he painted. But on one day, the Pope brought Biagio da Siena, a very high-minded man, uh, who Vasari calls a master of ceremonies, to, in to see uh, Michelangelo's nearly completed painting. And the Pope asked Biagio, what do you think? Well, he said, quite directly and in front of the artist, this is totally inappropriate for the chapel of the Pope. Too this, many nudes. Too many nudes. Mm -hmm. This is appropriate for a tavern, mm -hmm. not for the Vatican. Michelangelo didn't like that. But Michelangelo had <laughs> his revenge. And as soon as Piaggio da Siena left with the Pope, Michelangelo painted his face from memory. In, 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 <laughs> On the face of, of the of, satanic figure down in the lower right. Yes, who is being devoured by a serpent. Yes, he got his revenge. He certainly did. Michelangelo so, often got his he way. He did. So now let's go back to where Michelangelo chose to put his self-portrait. Because I think that it's interesting. He's sort of, you know, he's in that area right to the on that same level as Christ, so he's with the saints and other important figures, but he's sort of hovering dangerously 
over this lower it's not just that he's left hovering. area. It's not that he's just hovering dangerously. It's that it's that Bartholomew himself doesn't seem to be paying much attention to the skin, and he holds <laughs> it rather nonchalantly, as if he might just drop it, let go. <laughs> yes. And if he let go, that skin would fall directly into the boat right. of Sharon and right. would be transported to hell. And it also looks to me like he's sort of midway. That skin is sort of midway between the saving power of Christ and the figure, who, the damned, the, the figure we refer to as the damned man, uh. who has just realized that he's going to hell. Clearly indicating Michelangelo's uns own uncertainty, which we also know from his poetry during this period, the uncertainty of the fate of his own soul. Um, whether he would when he died, because he was an old man by now, although he would live much longer, go to heaven when he died or go to hell. And obviously Michelangelo's great fears that he would go to hell. And Michelangelo, I think, even at this time, looking up at the ceiling that he had painted 25 years earlier and wondering if that early work that celebrated human beings and the human body and was not so obviously in the service of the church would somehow... Damn him. Damn him. Or, you know, or I, I, not be I see, helpful on that day of judgment. It makes sense to me. And, and I think it's actually that argument is strengthened by the fact that Michelangelo chose to render himself as an empty shell. Mm -hmm. as a skin yeah. because you use the term soul what what direction Michelangelo's soul there right. is no space for soul here That's in a true. sense could this be a kind of indictment as you spoke of that he has spent his life creating fictions right. that he has spent his the life empty. creating um, in a sense the outermost skin right. um, likeness but with, without substance mm -hmm. right because here we have no no interior, no soul, no mm -hmm. substance. Mm -hmm. Is that what he's done? When we saw him bring, breathe life into stone, right. was that real life? No, not as God creates life. Right. But, but, and but yet there's a kind of pride. A falseness, a false pride, right. yes. And it must Michael have been... Michelangelo is the creator. It must and his have. nickname, of course, is Il Divino, the divine one. And so is this... Michelangelo in his later life beginning to rue, in a sense, his braggadocio, right. um, to rue his... His pride uh, yeah. in, in his own creations. These were the very questions that the church itself were beginning to ask. That's the right. Reformation, I think, caused a tremendous questioning. And we see it here in the microcosm of one man's life, mm -hmm. but I think it was a set of questions that the church as a whole was yes. beginning to How grapple with. How does one get to heaven? Is the church you know, the the only one way to get to heaven. Are the, the you know, sacraments, the, do they do what they said they would do? Is the is pomp the, and ceremony of the church essential, that, or right. is it in some way a bar? Right. And, right, or is it about a more personal relationship with God? Is it about prayer? These are all questions that I think absolutely inform this painting and it thus make this painting an expression of the Reformation and the Counter-Reformation um, that will this, develop. This, this, this moment of, of religious questioning and, and turmoil. This is a painting that is all about turmoil. Yes.